you know, knowing how to fix your own plumbing, your own electrical system in, in your home and being able to do those things. I think that there's a desire, there's a desire to get back to that. The Fred Minnick Show is brought to you by Michter's and 291 Colorado Whiskey. And joining the Fred Minnick Show is uh, the one, the only, Jay Buchanan, recently featured in uh, The Rolling Stones, the lead singer for Rival Sons. How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm doing good, Fred. I'm doing very good out here enjoying the weather in uh, Southern California. It's really nice. Now you have been you have been getting uh, a lot of uh, a lot of press lately, and I want to go to the the Rolling Stone piece on you about wanting to uh, unify subsets of rock and roll. And you know, there's this is a kind of a weird time for rock because it's kind of like going all over the place in a lot of ways, and you do have that kind of a classic sound. And you know, what's it what's it going to take to 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 make that sound to the same mainstream level that we have like post Malone and um, I don't know and how Britney Spears I, I used think, to be. I, I hear you. I think I know what you're asking, Fred, uh, you know, to be cut right to it. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think, I don't see in the immediate future, I don't see rock music um, holding the place that it once did you know in the gold in the golden era of rock i think that there were a lot of factors at play mm -hmm. um that aren't that aren't easily uh, accessible and I, i'll i'll give you some of those factors i think that that made rock music so huge at the time that it was at its apex you have to understand that um recording technology and recording was a young a young art um pop music was a young art and just after pop music you know rhythm and blues came into the picture once uh, people started making records once you start having radio stations you have 45s you know long before mm -hmm. you have artists making entire records and everything you're talking about a span of 20 to 30 years now along with that you have the exploration that's going on internationally with these mediums um, and you have the artists trying to be themselves, but at that same time, this is a new, extremely lucrative business. So then you have the commerce end of it. The commerce end of it was funneling through what is going to work and what isn't. You know, um, there were far less genres of music uh, at that time, and the the powers that be, the the labels and the promoters and commercially and otherwise they were really really putting rock and roll up on a mantle because at that time it was still quite a, a new art form right and uh so now you fast forward you know 20 30 40 years whatever and where we are now we've seen that same sort of renaissance happen with so many other types of music you know you look at what has um what came from hip-hop and R&B and all of this stuff and what that's flourished into. And that's, you know, hip hop rules the world these days. Hip hop even more, you know, than pop music. But you have those things in their shared production styles. It makes perfect sense to me. And when I think about rock and roll, I'm not really trying to get it back to like the golden age or anything. Yeah. But uh, uh, as to your, your direct question, though, about unifying... Uh, that with that article in Rolling Stone. Well, I had set out to, um, along with with uh, the band, you know, and, and my partner Scott Holiday in Rival Sons, we'd been talking about making a festival that would that would encompass all, you know, the full variety of where rock is right now. Um, I feel that there are sub genres within rock. Uh, that I've seen, you know, over the last 10 years that I've seen, and I see them being more disparate in their approach. And I think it's time for everybody to just kind of lock arms. You know, we've had a very robust career and it continues to flourish. And I want to use 
our momentum for the bands that are underneath us that are coming up out of the garage mm -hmm. and in the same way that you know bands like black sabbath the rolling stones aerosmith like all of these all of these great bands deep purple all of these giant bands they've done that for for me and for rival sons they've given mm -hmm. us those opportunities so i want to keep it going you know well, I think I think that's um, a, a really like uh, you know courteous way of looking at it. But you know, it is a def it is a defining moment right now for for the genre, and uh, you know, of course, you're rocking an ascot. Naturally, you're becoming the leader of the of the movement to uh, <laughs> to preserve it. So, by the way, nice ascot. It really it really is a nice ascot. Thank you very much. It's actually it's a kerchief made by Hank's kerchiefs. It's oh, wow. um, you know, Colin Hank's uh, director, actor, all of that. Um, he uh, he started this company. I don't know about two years back, and they've kept me flush with gear, and it's so you, it's you comfortable. You, you have fashioned it in such a way that it could pass as an ascot. Very nice. You know, I have a I have a ridiculous, uh, <laughs> a pretty ridiculous collection of actual ascots, and like I said, Hermes and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that anything you put around your neck and and tie it right, it's an ascot or a Back cravat out. or yeah, what it. you know what I mean. Like, because yeah. I've seen I, I there was this I I ran a restaurant back when I was still a kid, but I ran a French uh, restaurant. And there was this French bum. It was down in Costa Mesa. There was this quasi bum that would come in. He he didn't have a lot going on, but he had a dirty three piece suit, and he had a white shirt, um, and he always he just had a bandana, you know, or like a, just a silk scarf, and he tied that up, and he he used that as an ascot. Yeah, and he, whenever. It's that's however a, you wear it, man. Yeah, that's right, man. That, that's an awesome story. So, another awesome story is I sent you some. Uh, I sent you some whiskey. Now we were trying to get this scheduled. We had some scheduling issues, and then um, and then you moved, and you and you drank one of the whole bottles before before the show. So, let's uh, let let reveal to the world what what bourbon you love so much. You, you kicked it back. <laughs> oh, you know, I mean, I've I've it was. Uh... It was Michter's, the Kentucky, Kentucky straight bourbon here. Um, you know, Michter's is one of those. It's not that high on my list necessarily, this one. But this is, I mean, you know, their Kentucky bourbon is just, it's a real easy drinker. And it's one of those, like, um, it's like the textbook of a, of a good straight bourbon. That's like that would be like in the dictionary, along with you know four or five others. But it's that a, it's, was um, it's a great everyday's pour, that's for sure. Yeah, it, that's exactly that's exactly it. And I think uh, I had packed everything up uh, and all of my whiskeys and bourbons and everything, and uh, it's really stressful moving your family across country. But I had this box sitting out with all of the other moving boxes, and I go, you know, I can't make it to the bottle shop. And I know there's a bottle of Michter's in there. I know I can replace that. I don't know what else he sent. You know, I don't know what else Fred sent me in those smaller bottles, but I know there's a bottle of that. Well, so, what, um, I, I, what I did send I proceeded send you, to. I, I sent you. I sent you uh, MB Roland, which this mm -hmm. is a. Um, this is a Kentucky single mash whiskey. So this is a. This is something that's pretty pretty unique. And MB Roland is a uh, small distillery in Western Kentucky. Uh, big, big fan of what they're doing, but they're tiny. And I also sent you a Peerless Rye. Peerless Rye yeah. is also a uh, small distillery in Louisville. So we've got we've got three three small or two really small distilleries, and then one kind of mid tier one. So Michter's is a is a, a touch on that mid tier side. And uh, I'm curious, what do you what do you normally drink when you're when you're out on the road, or um, what do you normally drink? Uh, you know, I think it depends on if I'm in. We're in Europe. Spend typically right about half the year in Europe, typically. Um, and so hey, you got to show Europe, at Stockholm coming up pretty soon in July. The yeah, Lollapalooza. that's right. 
Yeah. That's right. That's right. So mainly over there, good, great, um, like Scotch whiskeys and, and, you know, those tend to be a little more accessible mm -hmm. over in those territories. And so sometimes you... I'll, 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 I'll start a tour and I'll pack a few bottles away. Um, but for the most part, I think on tour, I love, uh, red breast you know is oh, a big one that's nice. that's that's a mainstay it's just yeah, that's a comforting whiskey and uh and then you know the 12 is that's the go-to mm -hmm. and then you get that 15 uh every now and then it's just a delicious del deliciously unoffensive oh uh, i wish i had known that i would have uh i would have sent you the 27 well I think when I sent this out, I didn't think I don't think I had the twenty-seven year old. I've got. I'll send you. Go ahead. I'll 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 hit up uh, your publicist and send send you some uh, twenty-seven year old of red breast. It's a it's amazing. It's like I've heard, I've heard, and uh, I'm I have every intention of tasting that. Yeah, that it's it's, it's otherworldly good. It's on a it's on another level. So, um, yeah. So this is we're definitely not in the Scotch realm here. We're in we're in the American no, whiskey not. side. And you know the the uh, flavor profiles of American whiskey are, are are obviously so different than Scotch whiskeys and Irish whiskeys. And one of the big things is is def is the is the New Chart Oak Barrel is uh, is such a, a game changer, and it gives us like all of our styles. And you know I think let's go to let's start off with let's actually start off with the Mictors. And Great. I was hoping you were going to say that. Yeah, I know. The, I know this taste, and it's right up the middle. That's about right. Yeah, that's, that's right. When the other two are definitely not, they're going to be palate changers. So you're actually tasting the bourbon. I'm tasting the rye, and um, reason being, much much like you, I did I did polish off my bourbon. So I. Uh, I, w I too was a you want to know something uh fred when i was at the store i prefer the rye over the bourbon <laughs> no for way and, and so, so you were going to you were going to get hilarious to hear and so you got the bourbon and i got i love it it's awesome i was and i it even crossed my mind uh i thought you know i could pick up this bottle of rye and i'll just drink the rye and act like it's the bourbon because i like the rye better <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> there is something really great about the rye. I, uh, to me, I love the mouthfeel of the of the Michter's rye that, and there's like like a little back end of caramel. But mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, that is funny because I was like I was like shit. I'm out. I'm out of Michter's bourbon. I mean, I've got like the 25 year old. <laughs> and You're out of Michter's bourbon. Oh yeah, my so goodness. <laughs> yeah, that is that. That's hilarious. So I, we'll call each other out on that one. Yeah, you Perfect. know, as we as we should, right? <laughs> so how is how has uh, you you all are a band that everybody who sees you live, you know, they just they talk about it. Seeing you all perform is an, is an experience, and I have and your 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 stage performances are you know legendary. I have to imagine that this is a the pandemic has been really difficult because you can't get on the stage and interact with your, with your fans. How have you, how have you coped with that? Big Mictors. Well, I, I <laughs> Mictors, I think that this has been, this has been a great year, uh, personal year for bourbon, um, <laughs> for me. And, you know, I think so much of it has to do with identity, Fred, because, uh, I'm, I'm used to doing that every day singing and the exercise it's a physical exercise it's a hammer hitting nails and it's a horse running the track and um i think that the the most difficult thing has been that protein missing from your day you know yeah Being at my whole life singing and performing you know uh the majority of the year for forever and so having that that thing that edifies you see taken away and removed from the equation has really been something but at the same time it's you know you can't scorn it you, you can only scorn it so much because all of us to have 
it's forced us to be more introspective and maybe take stock about uh take stock in why we do what we do like what we mm-hmm. why we really do what we do and, I, and that ranges far beyond performing musicians of course i think that that, that all of us you know yeah. enduring this pandemic yeah, and of course, you know it, the 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 show that you all have at Stockholm in July is that your is that going to be your first show uh, to be on stage? Well, if everything, well, if everything goes right, that ought to be. Even at this point, you know, it's not as if the the, the performing music, the live music industry, has an inside lane on the CDC. You know, we we don't know how it's going to go. So we're looking. Yeah. We've had to. Think you know we wait till the last minute to cancel things because we don't want to accept that that. But the truth is, like, hey man, whatever it's going to be, that's how it's going to be. I mean, but that's a um, that's a hell of a lineup, man. You you know, Post Malone. It is. Oh, absolutely. um, You all, you all are performing on the same day as Pearl Jam, which, you know, I mean, their fans have been like, you know, salivating to see them on stage again. And so, yeah, we're, we're really excited about it. In truth, you know, I'm holding out hope and just like everybody else is. And um, but we'll see how it goes. You know, I think we may try to do a, some virtual stuff in between mm-hmm. now and then. But it's anyone's guess. You know, if we can pull it together, then great. Well, but I would if we, I, if we sit here, we will. I saw that. I saw that lineup and I said, you know what? I need to reach out to them and get a media pass and go out there. I need I need some live music in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right uh, how have when, you how have you been getting by what have uh, you been doing to get by well in all of this i mean I'm, i know you've been busy with with doing this yeah i mean i'm i'm fortunate that you know i lost you know i do you know so i do music festivals and and stuff like that but i help organize some in kentucky and um you know what the festival i co-founded is was bourbon is bourbon and beyond and you know we've had ranging from stevie nicks to foo fighters um zach brown band so it's like a it's, mm-hmm, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a danny wimmer show and mm-hmm. it it is um it, it's been like I, I went from doing stuff like that and about to do a national tasting series with a, a major hotel chain to like nothing in like a day and then i started putting a lot of effort into like youtube into the podcast and uh, it just started clicking and then people started booking me for like virtual tastings. And so I basically went from, I went from like nothing getting, you know, booked wise for a good two month period to like everybody booking me, uh, who are booking me before yeah. just instead of a bar, it was, you know, on a zoom call. So it was very different. Right. It was very different. Well, it's good you've been able to to diversify. What about for uh, what do you do for leisure in these times? Well, I've got two young kids. I don't think I really have much leisure. It's um, <laughs> just oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, for leisure, I just think about back when I had leisure time. Yeah, and I reminisce. <laughs> I look at old pictures of uh, France and Italy and Vegas, and and uh, remember when I had a a smaller belly and less gray in the hair. <laughs> There you go. There you go. So, all right. So let's get to let's break these let's break these whiskeys down. I've got the I've got the rye. You've got the bourbon. We're both sipping on some mixers here. It really is good. delicious hmm. well it's five o'clock there it's uh just two o'clock here oh well so i, I guess you it, know now it's four, now, i guess now it's four o'clock this is jay this is work you know so you don't you don't have to worry about any of that stuff this is just pure pure work that's right well believe me yeah sometimes i feel that i've been paid i've been paid to drink <laughs> for the last two, couple of decades and yes we are doing the we're doing the lord's work here that's right i i, I like to tell people i drink for america you know it's yeah. it, it's the truth exactly that's great <laughs> okay so, so 
so you you are very familiar with the with the Michter's uh, bourbon, you know, and this is a this is a that's a product to me that's always got a, a big dose of brown sugar. Is the brown sugar coming there coming through there for you? That's brown sugar. It, yeah, it's like the that. It's the toasted part of the marshmallow, you know, like mm-hmm. the the brown mm-hmm. part that isn't burned, right? You know that the the caramelized marshmallows. I get a lot of that. And the um, the spice is on the low end, you know. It's not it it's not so peaky. Hmm. Hmm. There's not too much of a strong alcohol taste in this that- bourbon. That's you know. a, you know, that's, a, that's a strong point, you know, and, you know, sometimes, uh, and, and it's in that 90 proof range. And to me, that's like the perfect, uh, that's a perfect, like people like to say not 80 proof is a good starter proof, but I think 90 and above is better because you can taste mm. the, the flavors. I think when you cut it down too much to like 80, you, you miss out on a lot. Right. Yeah. I, I tend to enjoy, um, I tend to enjoy, uh, like the, Bottled and bond, um, and the uh, the the cask strength of, mm-hmm. of a lot of different uh, bourbons because they have they the character is so strong. You can just you you can dial back the uh, that hard edge yourself with a, a drop of water. So, well, speaking of cask strength, that's where we're going next with the uh, with the rye, the peerless rye. Now, what do you when mm. you uh, when you're performing? Will you drink before you get on stage, or do you, you know, um, I for the most part, any drinking before uh, going on stage would be very minimal, and I mm-hmm. mean the equivalent of uh, a shot. I don't, I don't really, I'm not keen to take shots of anything. But you, you know, you sip just a little bit uh, before you go on. Um, And then once I'm on stage, I'll keep a little cup on stage with right about this much. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in between songs, I'll just get enough on my palate just to wet and go down my throat just a little bit. Okay. Okay. and the reason that I do that is really, I don't like ingesting a lot of anything when I'm performing because with what how I have to sing, if um, if you get full, whatever's in here, it'll come up, you know, because it's basically like doing jumping jacks for yeah ninety minutes or two hours, so. and like all that acid, you know, wouldn't be wouldn't be fun. Well, yeah, there's that, and just not you know, not not like 1960s acid. I'm talking about like stomach acid, <laughs> right? Yeah, stomach acid, the original party. Yeah. <laughs> so this is great. The yeah, light's so perfect out here for this. It today. really is, and so this rye, uh, the they use a technique for their fermentation called sweet mashing. You know the traditional technique is called sour mashing and sour mashing it's basically they take um they they take a back set or or the the part of the distillation that drops to the bottom and is basically like a little bit of beer and they put it into the new fermentation that and it sours it kind of like you would make sourdough bread and that basically mm-hmm. reduces like bacterial infestation potential and mm-hmm. and so the peerless doesn't do that they just ferment clean up ferment again and it and it requires them to have like incredible sanitary techniques not to say that other distillers do not it's just it is a it's a lot of work uh to do it that way and they believe that you get more flavor out of the grain by doing it that way and Mm -hmm. i i tend to agree with them because you can get a lot of flavor out of these uh out of these ryes. Now this is a single barrel rye whiskey. 
coming from their distillery. They nicknamed it Rye Cherry Cola. Rye Cherry Cola. And for those who are, you know, listening to this versus watching it, the sun is glistening on on Jay right now. Uh, the it's just reflecting off of his glass. It, it's like it's like he's um he he's like a, a demigod in in Ireland with a um with a glass of whiskey, you know, coming to to save the um I don't know a, a a supernatural one of the one of the supernatural like kind of like fairy tales. Mm. Yes, keep you, going. I'm thinking uh, I'm thinking you're um you're the leader of a of a of a special you know uh, demigod unit that's uh like from Peter and the Lightning Bolt um <laughs> you know okay. All right okay okay too far that w- I went too far <laughs> By the way great no. great uh, book series Oh yeah This right away this is this is more my speed I mean, this is layered. This is layered yeah. in all kinds of baking spices and fruits. And the mouth, the mm-hmm. mouth is completely different from uh, what we had uh, with the Mictors. I like to say that Peerless's mouthfeel is oily. You know, so it's kind of like uh, you know, it, it, it's it's basically like there's just like all kinds of oily feeling, just kind of like dripping down. I I really love their mouthfeel. I really do. Yeah. I think they do a great job. It's yeah, it's oily. It's got that silkiness, almost like a. Um, it's not filmy, in the same way, but like a. God, who is it? What is the uh, like Grams? Uh, that, that Gra- Grams forty year. Oh that, yeah, uh, yeah yeah yeah. That port, really honey, that really silky mouth. Nice. Well, that is delicious. And the one of the coolest parts is uh, their master distiller is like twenty five or twenty six. He's like a a, a little uh, savant of a, really? of a distiller. Yeah, yeah. If you're ever if you're ever in Louisville, um, be ha- more than happy to introduce you to him. Really, really great people. And it's funny the the owner Corky Taylor has a huge connection to music. His uh, his his roommate was Greg Allman of the Allman Brothers, and wow. so so he has like all of these incredible stories of the Allman Brothers, and he was a pallbearer at his funeral, and mm. just um, just just great people at at Peerless. Okay, so I get it now. On the aftertaste, you get the cherry cola. Yeah, that's where yeah that's where you get it. It's it is one of the best like descriptions of a single barrel I've ever seen. Yeah, there's seriously yeah, like a cherry cola there. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's kind of it's it's a fun one just to sip, but it's kind of like you don't really want to stop sipping it, you know, and go on to the next one. So uh, if it's all right with you, I'm I'm just going to keep sipping on this one before we yeah, pour the next that's, one. Yeah, that's that's perfectly fine with me, because that is that this fits this checks a lot of the boxes of what I like in my in my dailies. Well, when you told you know? me that when you told me you were you you really liked a lot of the scotches, yeah. um, you know, in my experience, people who are lean towards scotch like rye more than they do bourbon. That's not always the case. That's exactly that's. No, no, I love rye, and you know, two of my closest uh, friends are not rye drinkers. You know, and I, I try to explain to them, uh, that, like, you don't taste those complexities, or you don't, you don't value that. Um, there's a harder edge on rye, I think, in general, if you're looking for, um, if you're looking for that sweeter palate. A lot of rye, uh, a yeah. lot of rice just have a different approach, and I think that that can turn people that can turn people away if they're looking for easy drinking. Or uh, whereas for myself, I like to, I I like to explore the character mm-hmm. in a bottle and 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 go on that ride. 
you know, it rye is also extremely misunderstood. You know, there is uh, a bourbon is federally protected. Like you can't make bourbon anywhere else in the world, but rye can be made anywhere in the world. In fact, it's yeah. made in Germany. It's made in Finland. Canada has its own style of rye. And it's uh, what gets bottled, you know, can can vary country by country. But in America, the standard is it has to be from a grain of, of at least it has to be at least 51 percent rye. There are some distillers that will do like 51 percent rye and then like, you know, 49 percent corn. You know, so it's it's yeah. like so close to a bourbon. It tastes like a bourbon. Right. And then um, and, and then you most of the rye is actually coming from like Canada and Europe. And uh, there's a few states that uh, grow rye really well. But mm. once corn started becoming more profitable for farmers, they basically gave rye the boot. And rye historically was made in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania is making a nice little comeback right now. But. Um, it's really, it, it really is, it really is a spirit that's on the rise to return, but man, it's got a long way to go. Long Do you feel that part of, part of that is, uh, like the resurgence in specialty cocktails and in, um, you know, that, that whole movement that was really going somewhere, <laughs> Yeah. you know, before the pandemic, but I, I, you know, rye gets used in a lot of drinks. Yeah, and it's 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 really it, I think I think rye makes better cocktails than bourbon. I really do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh rye basically the story of rye can in the contemporary sense can really be linked to one distillery in Indiana. It's it was a former Seagram's plant that uh sold to Pinot Ricard in 2000 and Pinot Ricard flipped it to uh, CL Financial in 2006. CL Financial, which is Angostura's parent company, then started like taking the the stocks of whiskey that were originally used in the blends for Seagram's and selling them in the open market to bottlers. And the bottlers would, uh, you know, say they would have a 12 year old rye and they just opened yesterday and say, like, hey, everybody, we distilled this. I'm a master distiller. Here's my 12 year old rye. Right. And and but there was there was so much of that going on, it kind of led to a bad taste in people's mouths of of like the business of rye at the time, but but all those bartenders were like, holy shit, this is good. I'm making a, a cocktail with Redemption, or I'm making a cocktail with yeah. uh, Templeton, and so it completely changed the game. And we're talking ten years ago uh, when that yeah. started, and then by that time. Um, you know, as you, you know, move up to like 2018, you had, you had bartenders basically only mixing with rye when it came to whiskey. So, you know, rye is a very flexible, very flexible in the cocktail shaker. And you see it getting its comeuppance. I do. I do. And I think we're starting to see like, there's a, there's a brand in Pennsylvania called dad's hat. Uh, that's doing really well. Uh, you're seeing Maryland, you know, do quite well getting the back into it. Sagamore Spirit, which is owned by Kevin Plank, the um, you know, the Under Armour founder. You know, so mm. you're seeing a lot of um, of trends toward growth with rye. But I think it's like anything right now. Like we don't really know where a lot of stuff is going. Um, you know the. White Claw comes out of nowhere and everybody's drinking White Claw. <laughs> I mean, well, right. But, you know, you, you you really have to take that with the grain of salt that it is in the same way. I remember, you know, for me making records when I was a, a, a late teenager and in my early 20s and everyone would look at me and they'd go, oh, well, what do you think about the Backstreet Boys? or Britney Spears or like all of this stuff that was coming out and said, there's nothing wrong with that. That occupies the taste for a certain amount of people. And if mm -hmm. anything, you know, I, you know, bands that are working to make something very unique, distillers that are working to make something very unique, all the white claws of the world are doing is creating, they're shining that con contrasting light on the people that are working really hard to uh, I, develop something 
that that's anyway. that's definitely a fair point yeah the the data on the younger uh, like so 21 to 25 the data on them is that they are they are not drinking you know so they're not uh they're not drinking like we did growing up and right. um and so they're more health conscious but uh -huh. they're they will drink white claw because they feel like it's healthier and then the the category uh that next one that 26 to like 30 year old they're not loyal you know so they're not loyal to a category whereas like you know their grandparents would just be a bourbon drinker or a scotch drinker you know they'll they'll be like all over so the 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 two genres you know coming up that are going to be the next big buyers it's really fascinating you know because it they they're unpredictable unlike any generation before uh when it comes to alcohol consumption you know one of the really good examples is well uh, you know wine. real quick why why wouldn't they be more unpredictable because they have more choices than have ever been out there before that's you know that's a, yeah they, that's, they that's have many point. more choices than than we did when we were in that age group that's that's exactly right and wine is one of those where it is is a very fascinating study like you remember the labels that there'd be chateau this or you know fancy can fa fancy castle you know yeah. those that kind of stuff doesn't appeal to uh, to younger consumers you know things like prisoner mm -hmm. wine does and uh you know to me it, it's like it, it's like both exciting and also just like a trend like i study trends i don't feel one way or another about them i'm just saying you know i i study them and i make analytical predictions off of them and and it's um they're i, I would say that this this audience is coming up is going to be clinging toward rye um in in a soda can fashion where we one of the things that we are seeing is we're seeing like these things that we call ready to drink uh, spirits are basically cocktails. Yeah, oh yeah, of course, yeah. And, and one of them that does really, really well is is our rye cocktails in a can, mm -hmm. or or mm -hmm. like Jack Daniels cocktails in a can. Uh, so I think, I mean, I think that kind of stuff is is going to insert itself into uh, into that. Why do you think that covers. is? Well, just Why? because it's it's easy, they're good, and um. And there's going to be a lot of marketing behind them. And, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's money pushing it. And because they're going to be told to drink it. But that um, doesn't that doesn't always work. It doesn't oh, always no, work. Of course, of course yeah. not. Of course not, man. Um, you know, when I, I see Rye, I see Rye coming back in a big way and it getting its due. Because when you think about the, you think about what has like in mix mixology has definitely come to the forefront and mm -hmm. it's it's only growing and i think that we um we have so many choices in every direction when it comes to what sort of spirits what sort of jeans you want to wear what sort of you know jacket or pendleton or whatever it is that you want to wear there's been a, a big push toward quality now, quality has uh, the stock in quality has has come up tremendously, and at that same time, at least with men, you see, you know, the urban lumberjack aesthetic come up everywhere. Guys want to have beards. Guys want to wear flannel. Guys want to wear jeans that are going to last longer than they will. Guys want to have one pair of boots that are going to be the best pair of boots. I think that people. Um, the return to the the masculine uh, the masculine culture within men uh, in America, I think that along with that, we're going to watch rye come up because rye is directly uh, related to that rugged individualism, you know, in a way that that's out. It's like an outside man in a way that um, uh, bourbons and whiskeys aren't. That's a that's a really you know that's a really good point and you know the spiciness of it falls falls into that and you know one thing is you know while we may see a return in the the masculinity 
I think that, you know, men are getting where there's an effort to masculinity should not be uh, confused as misogyny or well, yeah, a, oh, anything like not. that, yeah. you know? Yeah. No. So Embr em embracing uh, uh, masculinity has nothing to do with misogyny, you know? I mean, it's it's wanting to, you know, for a long time uh, in for a long time over the last two generations, they had come from a do it yourself generation of like, yes, I do know how to rebuild my engine. That's because they came from a time when engines could be rebuilt with a cherry picker and a, a tool set in the garage. You know, I did that with my father and and he did it with my grandpa but you know knowing how to fix your own plumbing your own electrical system in, in your home and being able to do those things i think that there's a desire there's a desire to get back to that mm -hmm. and i think you know misogyny is way over here that's that is a that's a behavioral uh, a behavioral thing and yeah I, I think if anything else like i could see misogyny going down as men feel comfortable to get back in touch with themselves i and i think that you know and i i have i have two boys and we're obviously both men uh, but i but i i always feel that you know people think that masculinity means that you're, you're rising above women i don't believe that at all i believe that good men um encourage all and, 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 you know, masculinity is, is like he's saying is like being comfortable in your own skin. Like, mm. I mean, you, you want to talk about someone comfortable in their own skin. I mean, look what I'm wearing here. I've got, a, I've got a flowery ascot and, uh, you know, a vest and a you know, plaid shirt and none of this matches according to most standards, but I like it. So, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I'm comfortable enough, um, in my masculinity to tell you, you look good. And I got a beard too, so I'm uh, got a little bit of the lumberjack going on. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, uh, final thoughts on on the peerless. It brings out our thoughts on masculinity. That does not happen go. very often here. It it it's a bold one. <laughs> so this next one I have not tasted yet. Um. Only 86 bottles of this one made. Wow, that's really good. Okay, so we're going to the MB Roland. Yeah, so this is this is essentially they they have they're calling it a Kentucky single mash um, whiskey where they're. Basically, basically, this is a extremely rare label in that they are mixing. Uh, this is what the recipe is: thirty-two percent corn, thirty-two percent wheat, thirty-one percent rye, fifty-one percent barley. So, um, and because they're labeling it as a whiskey. You know, they can put this in used barrels. So these aren't necessarily new charred oak barrels. But um, this is going to be a fascinating one for me to taste because this has got a lot of different things going on here. Now, what, these, what they do, and they're in western Kentucky, um... They get all of their grains from like local producers, and you know, Christian County is historic for using for growing white corn. So this is like white corn. Most of the, of the corn used in bourbon or American whiskey is a um, A2 yellow dent corn. So basically, the same level of corn that would make a potato chip or uh, a tortilla, something like that. I I, I want to see the corn that makes a potato chip. Did I say potato chip? <laughs> yeah. Tortilla chip. I, I want that chip. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I actually have a potato right over my right over my shoulder. There. I don't know if you can see that. But let me show you the oh, chip. Oh yeah, no, I see that. I see that next to the Blantons. Yeah, there we go. So there we are. There, there's there's there the potato. There's the uh, there there's the corn that makes the potato chip. 
<laughs> go go make me a corn tortilla with that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, excellent. So they are using white corn, and they they distill at low proof. So this is uh, they distill it and then put it directly in the barrel. So not many people do that. Most people will mm. cut it with water before they put it in barrel. So their their bottles are always still proof and barrel proof. Well, I am just smelling it. There's a lot going on in there. Yeah. Hmm. So there's some mint here, some peanut butter. I mean, mint and peanut butter are two things that I don't necessarily get. I get the peanut together. butter. Oddly, I'm getting a um, a savory scent, and this will sound really weird, but uh, let's get weird. Well, beef tartar. There's like a there's like a um, there's a bitter savoriness, you know, to beef tartar. I like that. Wow. Is there any of that any of that golden sun left here? Um there it's a little bit it, it's gone. The moment's gone. You've already found your clan in the <laughs> in, in the mystery world. All right, so this is tobacco for me on the palate. It's mm. um Yeah, definitely. It is really Leathery, tobacco-y. Oaky. I taste... Um, I taste... Um, def definitely oak. some oak. I think this would probably... This would go well with... Uh, with, uh, with a spicy cigar. Do you smoke cigars? Mm -hmm. Yeah, every now and again. You know, I'm not... Uh... I'm not an aficionado by any stretch. Uh, I think cigars, and a lot of the time I've even been in, in company with friends when they'll break up something, break out something really rare. Mm -hmm. I'll just be like, man, don't waste that on me. Like I'll appreciate <laughs> it, but I know you probably got five other friends that will appreciate it even more than I would. Do you worry about but, your voice with something like that? Like, is like no, you know, cigar really hits the throat. Yeah, uh, no, I really don't. And, uh, you know, I'll smoke cigarettes every now and then, even, and uh, and I'll have a joint whenever I want to. I don't really worry about smoking, uh, but I also get a lot of exercise. I think that you know, overall body health, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, that contributes to a healthy voice. For me, that's my experience because you'll you'll get people that will give you all kinds of hokum about what it takes but what i know is i live my life the way that i do and i'm mm -hmm. able to do what i need to do you know it's funny like uh it, this when i when i talk to singers uh i ask the question a lot about you know whiskey and um there i mean it's a mixed bag you know some people feel that you should not drink anywhere near performance there are some country performers who are like I'm actually better when I'm half a bottle in, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, there, are, there are many ways to uh, skin a cat when it comes to that. I, I think that it, it, it comes down to the individual performer. For me, uh, one thing I can't handle is being intoxicated. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like drunk on stage is the worst feeling you could ever. It's, the, it's the worst. I've only had it a couple of times in my life. Um, but being that intoxicated where you're not really with it, I mean, you know, you're there and you can do your job and you can lose yourself in the music and everything. But I know that for me, I have a hard time reconciling with being intoxicated on stage because I have a job to do. That job is to take everybody somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And, and if I'm not fully engaged and fully on it, um, you know, it's like you get sidetracked. You got to. You have to be able to check yourself and and stay as engaged as possible. 
Yeah. And if you're drunk, you're not going to be able to do that, you know? Yeah, I mean, when, when you're drunk, you can't do much, except maybe drink except more. Except drink more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had, mm. um, I, I'll do live streams where I'm doing tastings. I'll, I've, I've done them where I've tasted like 40-something uh, forty something things at a time, and I won't say I I, I didn't get you know drunk or anything like that because it's you know spitting, um, but we get a little what we say in the YouTube channel Loose. a little Phil chiltered. We got a little yeah. Phil chiltered because because <laughs> chill filtration is something I talk about in in my tastings and I and I said Phil chiltered once and I just it just kind of Phil chiltered. Yeah, I get that, and you know, um, we, you know you're drinking so for you to have that many tastings like man that's the laws of average it's you're gonna get nailed it's yeah. gonna happen from now and then you know from time to time it's the same thing with me if i'm drinking on stage there will be those times when it's like oh it just goes one toke over the line oh. so then i have to not drink at all drink water sweat more sing a couple more songs well, but you know, you you have a real talent. I mean, I, I I drink for a living. You know, I don't. It's not. I mean, that's that's my talent for the world is that I drink and taste. You know, so like um, that's all I got for folks. But you know, you actually you actually give something to the world in terms of like a, a, a beautiful talent, and you know, you've got fans for all over the place, and uh, you know, just a great band. You know, you guys are still crushing it. You know, it's been. You guys have been together. Wait, you 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 started the Buchanan band first. And yeah, that... I I had Buchanan. I mean, I've been making records since I was sixteen, you know. But like, uh, you know, touring successfully, touring as a solo artist, I did all of that for for years. But Rival Sons came together in two thousand eight. So we came together then, and it was really. I just, you know, I've just figured it was going to be a side project mm -hmm. because I, I, I was, and I remain much more of a singer songwriter at heart. Um, but rock and roll became <laughs> my main wheel really quickly. It rival sons basically shot off like a rocket. It was very unexpected for me. <clears throat> and it's been a wild ride. You know, we, uh, from our first European tour, our first European tour, I think, was in 2010. I'm um, opening for Judas Priest. Wow! And Queensrÿche was a uh, yeah. It was Judas Priest and Queensrÿche, and that was really something, you know. That's but from awesome. then on, now we now we've played with everyone. We've played with literally everyone, and it's been a wild ride. Well, and the ride keeps on going uh, in a pandemic. What uh, what's next for you all? We've been, uh, I think that we've been uh, taking stock, just like everyone else, figuring out what are we going to do when this uh, when all the dust settles. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you know, I've started a, a few um, a few other uh, projects. I've got an electronic project called The Obstacle. That's I'm really 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 excited about i have my solo project which is called uh holy spirits and um in between well, those two we and... can talk about holy spirits here today that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> we've uh but we've got that and you know I've, I've done a lot of work at rca in this last year up back in nashville and i was on barry gibbs record and that came out just a couple of weeks back and i think it it hit number one in the uk and i hit number one in four countries he got a number one here in the states and so that that record's done really well so awesome. i've stayed busy um but talking about rival sons our our main goal has been writing this next record yeah you know? and we're we're halfway through recording it right now so i'll be going back to nashville um in february um to finish recording the record but we're definitely we're looking forward to releasing that and getting back out on the road that's awesome i mean you know you all are you all are a you're a you're a known commodity you all have like you know super fans but 
also you are you're you're somebody that like you know some of these like um you know if, if somebody were were to like create a super band of like i i gotta imagine like you would be one of the you would be on a short list for you know to go and be a lead singer for like an upcoming band that would have like some some fellow a-list talent do you, do you ever get approached about starting a new band or <laughs> yeah yeah it happens yeah yeah it happens and I, or you know other friends that i have uh from other really successful bands they'll just be tired of what they're doing they're like, hey man you know you and i should get together and we should you know go over here and do this thing like that sounds great but uh, you know i'm fully employed right now <laughs> I've got a, I have enough going on. You know, it, it, it we've we're all conditioned by VH1 behind the music, you know, with all these Oh yeah. all all these stories. So I'd be I I it would be interesting to be a a fly on the wall in some of those conversations, but Well, you know, I I think uh you got to keep yourself uh engaged and and satisfied. And even for me, you know, in my band you know, with rival sons, yeah, we go through our stuff and we get bored of each other. We get bored of, uh, of playing the same songs. It happens. Why wouldn't it happen? It happens to everybody. I think yeah. that it, each one of us are, you know, as musicians or people in general, you're charged with the responsibility of entertaining yourself throughout your life. Um, so some people do that with education. Uh, some people do that with uh, physical activity and fitness. Um, you know, some people do it with exploring, uh, e exploring the, the finer points of bourbons and whiskeys. You know, some people do it with writing songs. But I think that no matter what you're doing, you have to you have to turn inward uh, and figure out what's what's not working right in the engine. You know, mm -hmm. so with bands, some bands, people get bored of what they're doing. And so they just they look out and go like, well, I need to go over here now. And I think that a lot of the time it comes down to the individual reconciling with where they might be falling short too. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's kind of like, uh, I'm beginning to notice a trend here. You have like this very introspective, optimistic outlook on life. And, you know, we may, we may want to create a new segment for the show, Jay's corner, where you're, you're giving life <laughs> advice to everybody over a dram. But, um, you know, in all seriousness, I love what you do. I love I, I love Rival Sons. I'm so glad we could finally get together and you you, you got to enjoy the the Mictors beforehand and and you got a new bottle and I'll send you some we'll send you some new stuff too. So um you I would uh, uh your cupboard won't be dry. I, I will take all comers when it comes to that because um it just really lights me up, man. I want to send getting you to talk yeah, I want to send you some. Um, I want to send you some like Prohibition era rye. I want to send you some mm. different ryes so you can taste through them since you really, really like rye. Yeah, but... I've had I've had a few different ones um, recently, and that there's that hard edge, that high alcohol, mm -hmm. um, that high alcohol taste. Um, I don't know what it is about my palate, but I, I I've always enjoyed bitter things, black licorice. Um, really spicy foods, but I like uh, I like things with a harder edge on them. You know, that would make sense why you like some of the older ryes. That's that was their mo is uh, black licorice. So, yeah, right on, man. Well, well this what, has what, been a real pleasure for me. What man. was your favorite? Was it the Peerless? Um, I would put. I no, I'm gonna go with the MB Roland. Um, for what's right up my alley well no see the period you have the mixers mixers is over here mixers mm -hmm. is a like i said it's, it's it's right down the middle it's great but it's right down the middle uh the mb roland is exotic it has a a very exotic flourish to it and now the peerless has uh has a real uh, a real complexity and it has that bitterness. It has that. It has that harder red. I yeah. I'd have to go with the peerless, but that MB Roland is really delicious. So we got a close call here. 
we got a close call, but Jay's going to give it to give it to Peerless. Now, here's the deal: they're in different categories too. Yeah. So um, you could you could actually say they're both winners. Well, I yeah. and be rolling. I, I smell the empty glass. Campfire. Yeah. Wow. Mesquite. Um, they're they're so different. You know, it's it's really hard to say one or the other because, uh, well, I'm liable to change my mind quite often. <laughs> That's how it goes. Well, this is really good. This is this is so cool to do. Well, Jay, it was great to have you on the show, and um, the the Super Bowl is next week, or mm-hmm. when this comes out. Do you have a you have a team uh, you're rooting for? Or? No. No, I really don't. I have to tell you, the last two months of my life have been the craziest of my life. Haven't had much uh, on television or much of anything other than, you know, we just had a baby. So I have my second son. Congratulations. uh, All together, that makes three for me. So I have that. I have moving my family back out west to California from uh, Franklin, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is moving east. I was the only one um, heading west, but we had to get out here with the baby to raise him around family and everything. But in between that and with all of these musical projects and recording with Rival Sons and writing and getting into this house, um, my hands have been pretty tied up. So I've had time for family and chores during the day. And once the sun goes down, a little bit of this. (laughs) Love it, man. Well, everybody, make sure you're giving Rival Sons and J.B. Cannon a follow on all socials. Do you have a social that you prefer, Instagram, TikTok? Uh, Yeah, just for Instagram is basically all I do now. I've I've really just laid off of never been a Twitter guy. Facebook, I think I disabled my account a long time ago. I just – so I'll I'll hop on Instagram every now and again, you know. And I prefer – if it's going to be my name on there, I have to do it for – a while I had, you know, hiring other people to do. I just can't do that, you know. Right if it's on. if it's going to be me, it's got to be me. But uh, Jay the Bird that sinks on Instagram, and um, you can look up Rival Sons on any electronic device anywhere. They're so go check everywhere. it out. Absolutely. Well, cheers, my friend. Thank you for coming on the show, and be safe. I can't wait to see you on the stage again, and I hope that it's at Lollapalooza in Stockholm. All right, man. I'll keep in touch with you. Thank you so much, Brad.